Hi! This video is going to digress slightly from the others as I'm going to discuss a question of relevance. You see, my specialty is pagan rituals of initiation, particularly in an Old Norse context. And whenever I have talked about these rituals, as I have been doing lately, there are always someone who are curious about whether I think that I would be able to reconstruct such a ritual in order to be used by modern people. Most of the people who ask are modern pagans who seriously wish for such a reconstruction uh, for their own religious or spiritual purposes. So what do I think? Well, I am what you could call a pagan, a pagan pantheist, and the Poetic Edda along with other sources of knowledge does provide me with a spiritual tool. But I'm more of a research type than a practitioner of rituals, so... Well, the rituals and practices that I have done have always been spontaneous and inspired in the moment. Uh, I've never been part of any organized cult, and I, I will never be, I think. Not because I'm against organized cults, but because I cannot let myself be limited by any one paradigm of thought and perception. I need to keep an open mind always, and that is the curse of the research scientist, I think. I can never stop at a particular view and say, hey, I got it made. And like anyone else, I think that everybody should be like me, but hey, it's okay if you're not. So, the thing is, I could I, or would I, be able to make a reconstruction of an Old Norse initiation ritual so as to be practiced by modern pagans, or perhaps staging it for a movie? Well, the answer is both yes and no. I could certainly create a spectacle that followed the ritual steps, and I could also provide it with teachings based on Old Norse teachings. Personally, I would have loved doing that if I had the means and the time, and I would have enjoyed partaking in it. I think it could be a wonderful and exciting experience. I think it would give people a sense of mystery and awe and divine presence. Uh, we human beings love ritual, and the more spectacular and the more dramatic, the better. And believe me, it would have been spectacular. So, as I said, I would have loved it, and I would have demanded that everybody got dressed up as Viking Age people and left their cell phones on the outside. On the other hand, we could trick ourselves. Well, we would trick ourselves if we really thought that such a ritual did anything but appeal to our sense of drama and imagination. I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. It is, however, very worthwhile to do things that trigger our imagination. And I'm not saying that the rituals of our ancestors were not real, or that they didn't have the desired effect of spiritual transformation, because I think they did. But we are not them. That is important to remember. We can access a tiny echo of their world, but we do not have in any way access to the way they perceived the world. We can imagine it at best and we would be better off imagining it, but we cannot live it. And they lived it. They lived mythology. To them, mythology was a map by which they oriented themselves in life and in dreams and in altered consciousness and even in the normal waking world. We may know a bit of their mythology, but it can never provide the mental, emotional, spiritual map for us in the same way as it did for them. It can't. Don't fool yourself. If you want to use the old myths, you have to apply it to a modern way of perceiving the world. And, um, and I have decided to su suggest how to. So let us begin with step one. If you have seen my latest videos, you know that step one of the initiation ritual is the vision quest. Apparently, people fasted, went through almost, almost strangulation so as to induce a state of near-death ecstasy, sacrificed animals with which they travelled into the underworld, or meditated or lucid dreamt in sacred groves, by streams, uh, or sacred mountains, and on burial mounds. Now, one, I would certainly not recommend strangulation, unless perhaps you're an adept because of some particular preferences, but really, uh, don't do it at home, you could die. The sagas tell us that people sometimes died from it, but they had a different and rather more casual approach to death than we do. So, secondly, I would not recommend sacrificing animals either. Firstly, because I hate cruelty towards animals and I would never ever stand for it. Secondly, because the purpose of the sacrifice would be lost to us moderns. We do not know how to ride the soul of a dying animal into the underworld. It would be just a meaningless slaughter. Third, meditating in power spots. Now. Now we're talking. This is a practice I would recommend. Learn how to meditate, practice it, and you, if you cannot find a power spot for your regular practice, create one. Find that power spot within yourself. 
There is a poem of the Edda in which the god Freyr sits down in the high seat of Odin, the so-called Lidskjelfer. This means the seat of openings, like a, a lead, something that opens up your perception, of course. Because what happens when you sit in that seat is that you see into all the worlds. And this was where Freyr first had his vision of the bright maiden of the underworld. So how do you create a seat like that? By remembering that this is the high seat of Odin. And then by remembering what Odin represents in yourself. You see, Odin means the spirit. He is the giver of breath. Breathing is important in meditation, so honor that gift of Odin's and pay attention to your breath. If you need to contemplate something while you observe your breath pattern, then contemplate on how Odin is the seeker of knowledge. He never rests from his quest. He always seeks. What does that mean? It means that this great high god of wisdom is wise enough to know that there is always so much more to know. He doesn't sit there and say, hey, I'm the king of the god and I got it all set. No, he walks into the world with endless curiosity, knowing that the universe is one big amazing mystery, even to his divine self. That wisdom always leads to more wisdom and that this is where his wisdom lies. Knowing this, if you want to apply that odinic quality within yourself, you begin by realizing that what you know about yourself, about others and about the universe is merely a platform from which you gather more knowledge. And then you will begin to be wise and find your well-being. Second step of the initiation is the vision. The vision that is actively sought is the vision of the bright maiden, the goddess. Well, whether you are inclined to be a goddess worshipper or not, you should realize that the goddess of the Edda represents, whether real or metaphorically, your own inner being, your own immortal soul and your own fate. The goal of the initiation is to unite yourself with that. The Viking male used the image of a marriage with the goddess, but they knew well enough that it was a union with their true self that was at stake. The Viking female identified herself with the goddess and invoked her within herself. There is reason to believe that rituals of initiation for males and females may have happened simultaneously, a male and a female initiate together enacting the sacred story. Now this second step was not the union itself, but the vision of the union that would be at the end of the journey. Meaning that the beginning of the initiation for us moderns would be to learn how to meditate on our breathing, the gift of spirit, to try and apply the uh, attitude of an endless student, someone who is always a beginner and a learner, someone who knows that no matter how much we, th we think we know, there is always a lot more that we do not know. Someone who, like Odin, is willing to learn, always. And then, when deep in meditation, contemplating your own soul, your own true self, the divine fate that lies sleeping within you, and that you want to wake up and integrate in your life, and eventually in your death. This is when the third step of the initiation begins, the journey, the descent into Mistihel, the underworld, alternately into Utgardr, the world of the giants. Let us stop and ask what Hel really means. It actually means hidden. The name Hel not only refers to the goddess of death or the world of the dead, it denotes the hidden realm of the soul, the hidden realm of your soul, of my soul, of everybody's soul. In modern terms, the subconscious. Now, I'm sure um, that some of you believe that you do not have a subconscious, that you know yourself and what drives you, and I believe that once myself, but it has been my repeated experience and, well, my repeated experience that we all have a waste ocean of that hidden realm within us. Hell is within. And that sphere, where we keep everything we have forgotten, contains the trolls and the giants that will keep us away from the bright maiden, our own immortal soul self. Another name for this subconscious realm is Utgardr, the world of the so-called giants. The name Utgardr means the outer world, that which is outside of our ordinary perception. Giants is an English translation of the Norse word Jutnir, and if we were to translate the word literally, it does not mean giant, it means devourer. They are that which devours our souls. 
In the Edda, these trolls and giants that the heroes have to conquer in order to gain access to the Hall of the Goddess, that is, to their true selves, all have names and functions that describe what they represent to the initiate. They are the personif personifications of hatred, of anger, of greed, of limitation, of standstill, of jealousy and of fear. Fear being the most important point and the quality that is most often referred to. We are told repeatedly that only those who are without fear may enter the golden bright hall of the goddess. Now, fear means a lot of things. It is not the fear of, say, bad guys or heights that are the most prominent obstacle to human spiritual evolution. Fear of bad guys and such is out there, is, is out there in the open and may be dealt with if you want to. What is the real obstacle is the fear that we do not even know about and do not understand. It is my experience that in our modern world, the greatest and the deepest and the most hidden of all fear fears held by almost everybody, male or female, is the fear of not being good enough, the fear of not being worthy, the fear of not being loved. This fear has something to do with the way we have been brought up and with our relationships to our parents and our families. I think this type of fear is the modern equivalent of whatever the ancients experienced. You see, from the side of nature, it does take a village or a tribe to raise a child. A child needs to grow up in a sort of tribal surrounding where they know almost everybody and everybody part takes in raising it, and where they can access the experience of people of all genders and ages. But in our world, a child often has a couple of adults to relate to, just a couple of adults to relate to, and older children are not taught to take care of younger children, and old people are put away as useless baggage, and children are usually left in the care of strangers who do not really care about them. And this situation creates in the child a sense of not belonging anywhere, and it will always reason that there is something unworthy about it, something that is not good enough, because if it had been good enough, it would have felt like it belonged to a group that welcomed it. And this, in turn, creates a sense of self-loathing and self-obsession that usually either leads to aggression towards itself or towards others. It causes the kind of blind, ignorant struggle that led to the death of wisdom and wholeness as described in the myth of Baldur. This underworld initiation is about daring to wade deep into the caves of our forgotten history which is situated in our bodies, in our cells, in our minds, in our emotions. The more we unravel the, the compartments of forgotten tensions, the closer we get to the whole of the soul, the more we will love and accept ourselves and the greater will be our well-being and our wisdom. This is an underworld journey that takes years and requires guidance, professional guidance, yes. You think those ancients did it all by themselves as a sort of mind trip? No way! They had professionals all about them, who carefully aided them through their journeys. Even the god Odin had them. This staged ritual we're speaking of is a symbolic culmination of after years of training. So I have to finish here, but I think you get my drift. You can use ancient mythology to help yourself through a path of initiation into the deeper mysteries of your soul, but it does not take away the need to learn to know yourself and release a lot of the negative programming that you have accumulated during the, your early childhood and so forth. I would recommend therapy work such as emotional freedom techniques and the Rosen method and I'm sure many others. Knowing yourself and your true worth is the key to the transformation, is the key to letting go of fear, is the key to the gates of the soul. So, okay, have a nice day.